Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen, risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, Christ have, have mercy, mercy upon us. us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Together we say the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated on the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God the Father. Amen. O God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore I can lack nothing. He shall feed me in green pastures and lead me forth beside the waters of comfort. He shall refresh my soul and bring me forth in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You shall prepare a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup shall be full. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please pray with me. Father, this morning we ask that you would show us what you are doing here, what your purposes are for us in this place, what you are about with your people, that we would find immense comfort in knowing your love and your call, and that we would be inspired to continue in the work that you've given us to do in this place. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, my name is Drew Miller. It's a gift to be with you, worshiping online. Um, and I know some of you, uh, some of you are uh, traveling this weekend and have been here recently. And so I just want to take a moment to thank those of you who supported me and my wife in, our, in the birth of our first child. It's been a joyous couple weeks. And um, it's been an incredible, uh, a humbling privilege to be so well cared for by this people, this church. And we have been. I mean, um, they called that first week that we got here when um, y'all left uh, a mountain of paper towels, called it a pounding because you're supposed to bring a pound of everything we might need in the next year. I think this qualifies as a pounding too, but they're my pounds that I'm collecting thanks to all your food. And I, uh, I appreciate it. It means a lot to Jesse and I. And to Silas. So when I was a child, I loved reading Madeline Lingle. Uh, her young adult fantasy was captivating, the adventure stories that she told, and they're always wrapped up in a spirituality that was similar to what I knew growing up in the church, but foreign also, um, strange, um, but beautiful and compelling. And her most famous story, the one they just made into a movie a few years back, was A Wrinkle in Time. And it tells the story of a young girl and her baby brother living in a small town, dealing with all the awkwardness of adolescence, um, but an awkwardness that was made worse somehow by the fact that they were very strange children. They're bright and sweet, and you can't help but love them when you read the book, but they're clearly different. They're made fun of in their school, sidelined. Even just looked upon with a kind of suspicion, because not only were they strange and smart and so kind of making the other kids look bad and awkward in all the ways that adolescence makes you awkward. But they also had this against them. Their father had disappeared almost a year prior and no one knew where he had gone. Some thought he was killed. Some thought he ran away with another woman. No one really knew. And so these kids suffered both from being strange, uh, but also from being estranged from their father and the way that that made them uh, feel in the eyes of the community. This rejection, the sidelining, it continues until the day that they meet a stranger named Miss Watsit. And Miss Watsit is very strange indeed. She must be a witch of some kind, but a good one. She seems to be genuinely good. When she comes to visit, she is bringing life and hope to them. And as she brings them into the circle, into her circle, it becomes clear to the children that she's not a stranger to them. Or at least they are no stranger to her. She knows all about them. Indeed, she knows their father. And not knew their father, but knows him still. She knows where he is. And so she begins to explain through many different ways the trouble that their father is in and how these two children are the only ones 
who can help. And it becomes clear along the way that there's strangeness that causes them to be rejected and sidelined by the friends at school. That that strangeness is, strangeness is not theirs alone, but is a strangeness shared with their father. And that strangeness is far from a hindrance. In fact, it's part of the very thing that they will need to save him and to complete the work that he has begun in saving the world from that great darkness that was creeping across it. In our New Testament lesson this morning, Peter is addressing believers who have been rejected and sidelined by the community in which they found themselves. He's talking to Jews and Greeks who are perhaps not in direct overt persecution, but in a kind of cultural context in which they had no power and found themselves often marginalized, rejected by society. And in the first three chapters of his letter, Peter addresses them in ever-expanding circles. Chapter one, he explains the gospel that had won them, explains what it means to have been called by God into new life in Christ, he explains what it means for this gospel to have implications for how they live, for personal pursuit of holiness, for personal pursuit of the mercy of God, likeness with God, that when we have seen his glory, that should, have, that should compel us to pursue uh, a similar glory in our own lives, the glory of holiness and of love and of compassion. It's the first circle, and he takes a step further. That call of the gospel not only should affect how we view ourselves and our purposes, that our, our goal is holiness, but it should expand into how we treat each other. It trickles into the beginning of chapter two, which we didn't read this morning, but it, Peter describes how we are called to love each other. If we've been given this great love from the Father, that should mean that we love each other with the same level of mercy and compassion that the Father has extended to us. There can be no room for malice amongst the people of God or envy or hypocrisy because the God, is, the God who is creating this community is creating it in love, by his love and his mercy. And that should, like some, uh, it's kind of weed and feed, the season for that, isn't it? It should be knocking out the malice that's in our hearts and growing the right love of God and love for one another that his love has produced in us. So our passage this morning picks up there as he widens that circle still further. He starts with the individual, then the community, and now he's explaining what this community, the Christian community, is all about. What does it mean for us as Christians to live together in community, especially in the context of a culture that is beginning to reject it, that is stumbling over it, that is sidelining it? What are we about together as a church? What's actually happening here as society ignores us or sidelines us or pushes us away? What are we about? And so Peter begins to explain this to us using a metaphor that strikes us as weird. He talks about living stones, stones that are somehow alive. And he points to Jesus, who he calls the great living stone, the cornerstone describes him as this key bit of the foundation that sets the lines for the rest of the building. The living stone, so he's a person, he's alive, but he's metaphorically a stone placed by God, the ultimate builder of all things, on which God intends to build something else. God lays down this living stone as the beginning of his new construction. And so Peter says, if you believe in him, if we believe in him, then as we gather to, to him, as we gather in worship and in prayer and in fellowship, what God is doing, he is beginning to put us, attach us to that first cornerstone. He's continuing his building project with our own bodies. We become living stones that he's using to accomplish his purpose. We are being laid down like Christ to build something greater. And though some will reject us as they rejected Jesus, God nevertheless chooses us and esteems us and places us exactly where he wants us. Because of what Christ has done for us, because we've turned to believe in him, that means that in him now we are chosen like he was. We are highly regarded like he was and we are placed like he was as stones in the building of a great spiritual house. Spiritual house. And what's he talking about there? What is this spiritual house he mentions? Well, he, 
gives us some hints as he continues to talk about the priesthood, right? as he talks about sacrifices. If you are thinking in ancient, the terms of ancient Israel and you think about a spiritual house in which there's priests and sacrifices, only one place makes sense, and that's the temple. The temple of ancient Israel, the temple in which God was present, in which humanity and indeed all of creation was gathered into God's worship. The temple, the place of meeting with God, the place of God's presence and of his ministry on earth. And Peter seems to say in this letter that, yeah, that presence of God, that place of his ministry, that is what God is building here in this church with each one of us. That's what he's doing. That's the great edifice that's being built off of the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. He is building a new temple, a place in which God will dwell and in which his ministry will happen. That means that we are becoming his mediators here on earth. Peter uses the language of priests, royal priesthood. Those who go between God and the world, bringing God's presence into the community, bringing the needs of the community before God in prayer. He uses the language of offering spiritual sacrifices. You know, as the ancient priest offered material sacrifices in, in the blood of lamb and goats, so we are offering sacrifices too by giving of ourselves, by giving of our time, our money, our ministry to serve those whom God is serving. We are all coming before God, being gathered into a dwelling place for God here on earth and being sent out by virtue of becoming part of his temple, sent out as emissaries of his presence into the community. That means that this church, even this church at St. John's, is not some kind of social club that's hosting those of like mind and of like social stature. No, we are a temple. We are hosting not those who are like us, but the very presence of God. Much better to think of the church as an outpost of the ministry of of God, an extension of his presence in the world, than as some kind of social gathering. And that's true, that we are the presence of God and his place of ministry in the world, even when society is actively rejecting us. This is what Peter is So keen to help us see this morning, the world rejected Jesus. The builders, those great societal builders, the movers and shakers, the ones trying to fashion a civilization, perhaps in their own image, trying to make the world that they think should exist. Those very people rejected the God who laid claim on them. Laid claim on them by his mercy, but nevertheless laid claim on them. They rejected that claim. They rejected that God because he was building a different kingdom than the one they wanted, building a different house than the one they wanted. He himself, Jesus, as he came, was the cornerstone of that construction, the beginning of what God was doing here. And the builders of this world saw no use for that stone and rejected it, stumbled over it. And you know what? It didn't change a thing. That's Paul's point in this passage. It didn't change a thing. Even the rejection of the great cornerstone was used in the building of the kingdom of God. The rejection of the stone of Christ was in fact the laying of that stone in place. As they sought to kill him, he was saving the world, you see. Even the rebellion against God was turned towards the purposes of God because this cornerstone was his. He had chosen it. He had highly esteemed it. He had found it precious. And now, as we find ourselves rejected in society, increasingly looked down on or sidelined or marginalized or not understood or stumbled over, as we increasingly find ourselves in that position in the West, that makes us no different than Jesus. It makes us, in fact, very much like him. Society has no place for those who place a higher value on human dignity than on profit margins. Our society doesn't know what to do with that. Society doesn't know what to do about those who place a higher value on God's commands than on our own desires or sense of our own identity. 
Our society does not know what to do with those who refuse to be defined by the conflicting desires within us and who commit to being defined by the word of God alone. Society doesn't know what to do with that. Don't know what to do with the people who find no need to defend ourselves because we know whose we are. We know that he's safe and that he is in fact leading us to himself. Society doesn't know what to do with this kind of person. And so they set this kind of person aside, sometimes gently, sometimes harshly. They stumble over it. They reject it, just like they rejected Jesus. Peter says they rejected him as they were destined to do. There's no surprise there. It's no surprise that they would not be able to handle the kind of kingdom that Christ was presenting. It's no surprise, should be no surprise to us, if they can't handle the kingdom we are living into now. No surprise that they may reject us too. If they stumbled over that great stone, surely they'll stumble over the stones placed on top of it. Let's be honest, that can make us feel utterly futile, can it? It can make our work, our ministry, our evangelism, our love, feel like it's coming to nothing. When society increasingly sidelines, marginalizes, stumbles over what we are seeking to live out in this world, it can feel like we are losing ground. It can feel like we aren't making progress. Like there's no lasting value in what we are doing. Like many of you, I have seen some of my closest friends stumble over Jesus and over the faith that I carry the faith of the church. I've seen some of my closest family members, those I love, stumble over Jesus and stumble over me. And some of you have had that same experience in which you seeking to be faithful produced the exact opposite reaction that you hoped for. And it can be very easy in that position to begin to wonder if your faith actually matters, if your ministry is having any effect if your care and your love is sinking in at all, or if it's just bouncing off the back that is hardened against you. But Peter says that just as the Father chose Christ, though he be rejected by men, so he has chosen you. As the Father has esteemed Christ as precious, so now he esteems you as precious. And just as Christ was laid as the perfect cornerstone on which to build this new temple, this new presence of God in the world, laid down in his suffering, mind you, even as Christ was laid down as the perfect cornerstone, so now we are being laid down alongside him and on top of him, creating that temple that God had intended from the beginning. Even in our suffering, God is still building his temple out of this very people, still setting it in proper order, still building us into that spiritual house that God intended. And he doubles down, Peter does, at the end of this section. Those who have stumbled over the very heart of God have done so as they were destined to do. But you, he says, you're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And those are beautiful terms. Aren't they beautiful titles? Even if we miss the fact that those titles were given to ancient Israel first. These are the ways in which God described his relationship with his chosen people from the beginning. And Peter says, now these words apply to you who have faith in Christ, you who have been found in him, who have turned to him, who are being gathered to him. You are a chosen race. Jew and Gentile in one family, You are a royal priesthood, those bearing the presence of God into the world. You are a holy nation, seeking the kingdom of God first. You are a people gathered for his own possession, for him to delight in. That's our identity. The identity that Peter wants us to remember in the face of suffering that may cause us to forget it. An identity that gives us a work to do. He tells us at the end that we are called into this temple, into this priesthood, 
into this royal family in order to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Proclaim the excellencies, proclaim the great works, proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light, which again is the very thing that God was doing in ancient Israel, calling the people out of darkness that they might be a light to the nations, that they might proclaim his glory to the world. What was given them to do at first is now given to us to do. Friends, the world may stumble over us. It may even reject us as they stumbled over ancient Israel and rejected them as they stumbled indeed over Christ and rejected him. And it may cause us to think that our ministry, our work, our family, our loves, our evangelism isn't working. It isn't worth it. But friends, that is not true. That is not true. God is building up his spiritual house. He is making his presence known in this place. He's gathering a people to himself, a people that he has chosen and in whom he delights. That's good news. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no wind. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us pray for the church and for the world. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. For Foley Beach, our Archbishop, and Chip Edgar, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially President Biden, Governor McMaster, and Mayor Myers Irvin. And we pray for all those who go into harm's way for us, especially Joel Billings, Hartwell Bryant, T.J. Carpenter, Jonathan Carroll, Alan Kopp, Caleb Fleck, Chloe Fleck, Colin Fleck, Matt Harvey, Brandon Johnson, Daniel Lamb, Andrew McCarrier, Peter McCann, Paul Miller, Tom Miller, Mike Shaw, Michael Sims, John Taft, Ben Thornton, Stephen Turner, 
Ricky Tyner, and their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Betty Armstrong, Cam Bridges, Teresa Carter, Mary Chapman, Lynn Gilbert, Harry Greenleaf, Nancy Hope, Andrea Kelly, Luana Miller, David Nelson, Shot Paget, Kay Paris, Jesse Pearl, Tommy Samaha, Phil Smith, Russell Stone, Paige Williams, Josie Wood, and Millie Yarborough. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent, and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Well, God's peace to you all. We've got a a few announcements for you. Um, Most important, coming up this week on May 3rd, this Wednesday, we hope that you can join us uh, back in the Fellowship Hall for Parish Night. Uh, We'll be serving dinner uh, starting at 5.15. Come and grab a plate. Uh, We'll be serving dinner until about 6, 6 6.15 or so. Uh, And then we will turn over to our program. We'll have something for all ages. We're going to be taking a look at uh, what it means to live into the Easter season, and especially uh, in light of the culmination of the Easter season, which is uh, Pentecost uh, and the birth of the church Uh, that we have inherited through the generations. So we're going to take a look at that. We hope you can join us again. That is uh, Wednesday, May 3rd. Uh, Our theme for our dinner is going to be Cinco de Mayo as we celebrate um, and just uh, uh, sort of make our way into, I stumbled with my words there, but uh, as we try and make our way into sort of the celebratory season of Easter, we take any opportunity that we can to celebrate. And so we're going to have a Cinco de Mayo themed meal. We hope you can join us this Wednesday, May 3rd. For that, again, we start at 515, serving meals. Um, Also, if you want to help out with uh, taking meals out, a different ministry that we are part of is Meals on Wheels, uh, and Craig McKenzie uh, is the uh, contact person for that. If you don't have his information, you can always contact the church, and we will put you in touch with Craig. But Meals on Wheels is a fantastic ministry. We're thankful to uh, Craig for his participation in that. And if you would like to get involved, Uh, we are grateful for that as well. So get in touch with Craig or uh, with us at the church and we will put you in touch with Craig 
if you would like to be involved with Meals on Wheels. A few things coming up on Sundays in particular, coming up on May 21st, uh, we will have our annual parish picnic. Uh, so we hope you can join us. That will take place after the 11 a.m. service back in the fellowship hall. So we'll say starting somewhere around uh, 12, 15 or so on May 21st. Also on May 21st, we're going to be rec recognizing our graduating seniors um, at our services on Sunday morning. So we hope you can uh, join us for that. And then the week after on May 28th is Pentecost Sunday. So uh, we'll be uh, celebrating Pentecost on May 28th. We have Vacation Bible School starting up the first week of June, beginning June 5th. We are full uh, in terms of our uh, children participants. Uh, we are looking for more volunteers. Uh, if you do know someone who would like to volunteer, please get in touch with Charlotte. And also, if you know someone who'd like to uh, participate in VBS, we do have a wait list, uh, and you can get in touch with Charlotte about that as well. Happy birthday to William Grantham and Hannah Hopewell, Christopher Wentzel, Jenny Rains and William Williamson, uh, two anniversaries that we're celebrating this week. Happy anniversary to Gray and Thomas Hunter and to Nikki and Billy Nasso as well. Our service continues now with our closing prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name. Amen. Just pray with me. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread. bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Continuing together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world a knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.